Okay, our next uh, presenter is Dr. Gregory Lawton, and he has been a member of the Baha'i faith since 1970 and embraces the faith's principles related to the oneness of humanity, the oneness of religion, and the promotion of world peace and unity. World peace and prosperity for all people and all nations. And he is going to share a recipe um, with us today, and that is a recipe for world peas. Let's give him a warm welcome. Gregory Lott. Give me just a moment here. All the presentations that I do are always so, so complicated. Yeah. But um, I like to um, bring a friend of mine every year when I, when I come here. And uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you all for inviting me here again uh, one more year. I think, John, this is my third year, I think, that I, I've been here. So thank, thank you very much. Deep, deeply appreciative. Um, every single year, it seems I have to start out with a profound apology. Because every single year, somehow, between John and I, things just kind of get, I don't know, just misunder we have these misunderstandings. And so here I am once again, and I think I misheard, John, what you said, because um, I thought it was world peace. And I think you I, I'm, I'm getting the idea today that it's actually about world peace. So, and, and then as you know, every year I come, every year I come, I bring a friend with me. So as a co-presenter, and um, he's with me again this year. And so I'd like to introduce him. Some of you may not have seen this, but <laughs> now I, I have to admit that it's completely my fault um, that Mui misunderstood. And I have to introduce Mui to you. Mui has been with me now for, I'm thinking going on something like 30 years that he and I have worked together um, very closely on all of our creative projects. Um, you know, whether it's painting, whether it's photography, whether it's right, whatever it is, uh, Mui's always a close part of that you know, and a good partner to me. But I did, from talking with John, I miscommunicated to Mui. So Mui, of course, thought that this was all about, this was got a food program of some kind, like, you know, foods from many different cultures or something, you know, I mean, that's what we, that's what we imagined it was going to be. So Mui, of course, trotted out his very best uh, recipe for world peace. And it was our expectation that that's what we would be presenting on today. So um, I always like to be prepared in terms of a presentation, but then I, I usually go off track. Um, and I'll go off track depending upon, you know, what I hear from, from other speakers, when I hear, when I hear wisdom spoken, I, I, I give that some, some thought, I put it in my internal blender. Here I am again on the world peace concept uh, in my internal blender, and I just mix it all around, and then I try to, to bring it back to, to, in a way, to affirm really what another speaker has said, especially when they've said something very profound. And so I probably will do a little bit of that today. Um, I also want to um, say that I think there was a bit of a misunderstanding between Yusuf and Mui as well. I think the two of you had a conversation, perhaps, and uh, you may have told one or two of the same jokes. Um, okay. But, um, you know, in, in trying to recover from this embarrassment, embarrassment um, we tried to come up with a way to integrate the concept of world peace into world peace uh, and find a cow path to peace, uh, so to speak. I don't know how many of you have grown up on farms like I did, but there was always a cow path from the pasture to the barn. And so that's cow pies as well. Uh, I don't think we're gonna talk about those. But we just call them farm frisbees. Um, but at any rate, so I'm standing here with this glass of water and I, I realize um, as, as I have aged, um, hopefully gracefully, and when you enter your eighth decade of life, um, I've come to the opinion that my opinions don't mean much anymore. <laughs> and um, I try to have as few opinions as possible. 
So one of the things that I'm attempting to do today, or will attempt to do, is to present some information to you and to make some comments about that, but um, not to, to um, saddle you with a lot of my ideas or concepts about things. I'm not gonna, not gonna go there. Um, if I'm correct, though, I think we are about to teleconference MUI, um, because MUI has a few co comments. And unlike me, MUI is very opinionated. So please, please, please forgive him, but I think he's ready to come online right about now. Hello? Hello? Hang on? Are we live? Okay. Okay then. I get this shot from my best side. Where's the camera? <laughs> Testing. One, two, three. Okay, okay, I get it. Hey, wait. Where's my makeup? Is this video in color or black and white? Okay. Let's get moving. Anyway, sorry to horn in on this presentation on the spiritual unity of nations. Did you hear the one about the monk that asked the hot dog man to make him one with everything? You get it? One with everything? How about this one? Well, a Baha'i, Muslim, Jew, a Hindu, and a Christian walk into a bar and the bartender said, what is this? Some kind of joke? So anyway, you asked about some moving concepts about unity. And I think that oneness is the result of unity. Unity must precede oneness for the condition of oneness to exist. All of the things in the universe are proof of the power of affinity, action, love, and unity. And things unify, like energy and matter, the product is more than the sum of its parts. Unity opens up new worlds for humanity. Creation, universe, and the multiverses, all things are interconnected and act together. We live in the age of the spiritual maturation of humankind, the establishment of unity, and the realization of the consciousness of oneness. Anyway, I hope this helps everyone. Now I have to hook it out of here. Time to get to the movies. Oh, and if you eat meat, chicken. <laughs> so probably, if you eat meat, eat chicken, or be vegan. Um, probably in a few minutes you'll understand that the real brains in this outfit is is the guy that was just on, or is on the screen here. That'll be quite quite evident. So. Um, I love the way I was introduced because it said I've been a member of the Baha'i faith since 1970 or going on you know, 50 years. Um, because the way I look at it is that for 50 years I've been trying to be a Baha'i. And I think many of us probably of whatever, I have to remember to keep turning, sorry, <laughs> um, of whatever faith or uh, non-faith or Whatever, whatever path we come from, probably, you know, we, we realize at this point that it's a process. It's not, a, not an event. And we just keep, in the words of um, uh, Abdu'l Baha, who was the son of the founder of the Baha'i faith, we arise and we struggle. And every single day, hopefully, we arise um, courageously and we, we continue that struggle. And so that's how I see myself as a Baha'i. Now, I, I will tell you, there's no clergy in the Baha'i faith. So I'm not a priest, I'm not a rabbi, I'm not anything. I'm, I'm just someone who's trying to, trying to be a Baha'i. And um, so from that viewpoint, I'm not a leader. I was at an interfaith meeting, and I think, Fred, you were there as well, and somebody came up to me and said, oh, you must be a friend of Michael Hampton's. And I know some of you may know Michael. And he says, he's, he's your leader, right? <laughs> and I said, no. <laughs> I said, no, we, we don't have any leaders. What we have is, you know, we have a, a group of Baha'is that are elected to serve certain positions of service. And none of them is a leader. And when they're not meeting, they don't have any status other than, than uh, being, simply being a Baha'i. So we don't, we don't have any of that. So I, again, I, I was, whenever I hear 
uh, you know, so-and-so has been something or other for 50 years, and it's like, uh, you know, I think maybe we're just trying to, to, uh, to live up to, to our ideals and to, to our beliefs. But one of the things that's central to um, the teachings of the Baha'i Faith is that um, actions are more important than words. It's what we do, and it's how we demonstrate what we do. Uh, that is more important than the words that we have to say. Now, words are, as you all know, words are very important. The words carry a lot of meaning. They carry a lot of, of, of energy. And they can heal and they can harm. And they are important, but more important that, uh, than that are the actual actions that we take in service to, to humanity. So if someone wanted to know what a Baha'i is, a Baha'i is simply someone that is working in service to all of humanity. That's how we view ourselves. And the more, hum the, the more humble, the more pure we are in that service, um, I guess you could say that's a better Baha'i, but that would even, even that would be, I think, kind of reaching. But at, at any rate, so I wanted to show you this here. Um, oh, can we cut the lights? Or will that interfere with the video? Yeah. Then it'd be easier for people to see this. So. Um, this is a service project that I've been involved in for the last six years. We call it Camelot because we don't have another name for it. We named it after the place where we do it, which is called Camelot. <laughs> and so we don't have another name for it. Um, but it's a project in which we've been working with um, uh, youth, children, uh, junior youth and youth for a number of years, get involved in many different uh, uh, many different activities, for instance, just today, this morning. Uh, Drum for Peace this morning. It's a drumming group. And so, um, any, anyone here know Josh Dunnigan? A very talented local drummer, uh, percussionist. And he comes in and he's teaching drumming classes, so we have a really nice, nice group for that. It's an open class if anybody wants to join us at, at uh, any time for that. Um, after we did the drumming, then uh, we dropped the uh, kids off at um, a bowling league, which is called Dimensions Unlimited. Has anyone heard of Dimensions Unlimited? It's been in Grand Rapids for 40 years, and it brings together inner city kids. So it's largely African American, but it's also you know white, and everyone's welcome. It's a very unified, uh, unified group. Um, but it helps to uh, build relationships of understanding and friendship among, among young people that primarily come out of the inner city. So I, I'm sitting here and I'm, I'm imagining that many of you are, are engaged in activities that are similar to this. But the point of my con uh, comments is simply to talk about the importance of action. That um, rather than to talk about our beliefs, um, that we are actually going out and we are serving the community in some way. You know, um, the issue of racism and uh, all communities are infected with this disease, and some more, some more than others. I come from St. Joe Benton Harbor area from my high school years and a community that's long struggled with issues of, of uh, racism. And long ago, I kind of figured out that really what people Everyone's alike. Everybody pretty much wants the same things. And one of the things that we want is we want to be friends. Uh, we want to be welcomed in each other's homes. Uh, we want people to be interested in us and the things that we, that we do. And the greatest thing that each of us can do is to offer ourselves to others, to offer our time, to offer our service to others. And, and yet I talk to so many people and they're afraid to make that first move. You know, they're afraid to find that friend that's different than them and to make that, that first move and to try to build that relationship. But you know, once, you, once you begin to do that, it's relationship after relationship after relationship. So um, just to back up a little bit, when John contacted me about giving, giving this talk, and I started to envision it. He, unbeknownst, gave me an idea. And the idea was that um, I would take photographs of flowers, macro photographs of flowers for those that 
of you that know what macro photography is. So very close up uh, photographs of flowers. And um, I would combine those with a Baha'i quote uh, that focuses on peace. And I would do that for 100 days. Now, when I started that project, it was John that really was the inspiration for it. When I started the project, I didn't know that today would be the 99th day. Oh, wow. <laughs> and for those of you that know something about numbers and the number nine, okay, it's like a double nines. Okay. So today is, is that. So I brought, um, there's a hundred of them, and if I showed them all to you, we'd be watching that for 30 minutes. 30 minutes of flowers. Um, it would be lovely, but it would also be very time, time consuming. So I have a three minute version. So I'm going to show you the three minute version and let you see some of what came from that that was inspired by this conference. Oh, and with it, by the way, is some Baha'i music. I hope. frustrated because you couldn't read it. <laughs> Moving too fast. Yeah. I, I, I get that. And if I dragged it out, yeah, if I dragged it out. So those of you that would like this, I will give it to you. Um, I have, I think, 20 free books um, that I just give away. And they are on a website. Um, if you're on Facebook, you could friend me and I could send you the link. Um, if you want to email me, that would be gtlawton at gmail.com. And I will send you a larger version. 
Now, the larger version, I think, goes 12 minutes. Um, beautiful music with it, a violin, uh, violin music. And so um, any of you that would like that. Now, I do plan on publishing it uh, in a print version, but I'm uh, probably months away from that because I, um, tomorrow will be the 100th day, so it'll be the completion of the project. And um, I uh, think I have to reshoot 20 of the images just quite, aren't quite what I would like to have. And that's not going to happen until next year. Because <laughs> all the flowers are, yeah, the flowers are leaving. So, um, yeah. They would indeed, yes. They would indeed. But um, one of my beliefs is to always give something away. Always, always give things away. And so this is one of the things I like, I like to do. When I do presentations, I always like to bring art and music into it, into it as well. But um, so we, we heard that. I don't know if that was me or not. Um, we are the youngest of the world religions, and we are a recognized world religion, numbering in the millions of people around the world. Um, and what I like to do when I talk is say this: Baha'is belief. So it's what, it's what we believe. I'm not sure all Baha'is do. I got a couple other Baha'is here I can ask them. If I say something and say, hey, you know, Deb, do you believe that? Ginny, do you believe that? You know, I, you know, whatever. But I, I say that because one of the things that Baha'is believe is that we are, we are all one. And there is one creator, whatever you want to call him, her, that force, that energy. Um, and that creator has created all mankind as one human family. I mean, we are a faith that was created in 1844. That's why it's gone. At the same time that there was all of this expectancy of the return of Christ and people were wearing robes and, you know, buying white horses for Christ when he returned and all of that. Um, that same time, the Millerites, they were called. And um, at, that, at that time, there was a young man in, in uh, Shiraz, who announced himself to be that to be that return, and that was the beginning of that was the beginning of the Baha'i faith at that time. So again, Baha'is don't believe that um, we are here to convert anyone. In fact, we believe that the, that to approach people, uh, to offer charity or kindness to someone, um, and to expect conversion is hypocrisy. So um, what we what we believe in is basically service without any attachments, any attachments whatsoever, simply to help and to serve, to serve people without any expectation that anything will ever, would ever be returned to us. So that's more beneficial to us than, than you know, the opposite of that. But um, since 1844 and, and very much during the time of the Civil War in the United States, the 1860s, Baha'i faith was growing and developing, spread around the world. Baha'i faith is now the second most widely spread religion on earth, second only to Christianity. Um, so it's grown quite a bit in 177 years over that time period. Um, Baha'is believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. We believe in the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and all of the holy manifestations of God. In fact, what we believe is this that um, this thing we call God, creator, again, he, she, whatever we want to do, that that force, that energy, that light uh, sends these teachers to humanity about every 500 to 1,000 years. And at one point in time, because we didn't have mass transportation or mass communication, they would appear in this little community here. It might have been Jerusalem, or they may have appeared over someplace in India. And because there was limited opportunity to exchange ideas and beliefs and, and concepts, they had a major impact in a localized area, and, and maybe that, that religion was primarily limited to the area in which it appeared. But then we, we came to a time and this is one of the things that amazed me. And this, this moment of understanding came to me. I was in a museum in Chicago. And I was walking through the museum. And I had left 
eight, early 1800s, you know, 1700s, early 1800s, and I started to get to the 1835, 1840 something. And I was walking, and if, if you've been in the, the Chicago Art Museum, if you've been in there, different rooms, and you walk from one room, and you're in one period, and another room, you're in another period. And I'm like, whoa, wait a second. Where'd all the color come from? Where did all the color come from? Because I go back to the 1700s and before that, and everything is olive drab and brown and all of this kind of stuff. And all of a sudden, there's this explosion of color and creativity and, and different kinds of art. And at the same time, you can take that same concept and say, oh, yeah, and by the way, the Industrial Revolution, and by the way, the telegraph. And what was the, the telegraph message that was sent was a the very first day that the, the, um, the, uh, the Bob, meaning the gate, announced his mission. Same day, first telegraph message, and the message was this, what hath God wrought? What hath God brought upon, upon the earth on the same day? And from that time, now how are you going to have a world religion with a concept that we are all one that we are in truly one race. There actually is biologically only one race and then a bunch of ethnic groups that have that concept. It's meaningless unless you have mass transportation, mm -hmm. unless you have the ability to communicate globally. So in other words, spirituality is real. It is a real power. And it's working and changing this world all around you. And you are part of that process, that process of change. And so many people say, you know, what is your vision for the future? How do you feel about the future? I feel really good about the future because there is a two-fold process that is working in the world around us today. One is the process of disintegration. Call it the old world order. It's disintegrating. It is falling apart. It is chaos. Don't look at that. It'll scare you to death. It'll suck your vital energy. It'll take your creative energies away from you. Don't look at that as much as you can. Instead, look at what is growing up, what is coming, what is developing. The voices heard here today are a part of that process. You are a part of that process. And that is an unimaginable force for change. What is it moving towards us towards? The moment Baha'u'llah said that we are one people, that we'll, we will be united as one, that war and dissension should end, it crystal, began to crystallize in this world. Now, it isn't instantaneous, like boom, OK, it's all done. Any more than it was with Christ, any more than it was with Muhammad, any more than it was with Zoroaster, Krishna, Buddha, it didn't happen it would be too much for humanity to, to handle. It would be like giving them the entire bail all at once. We don't want to do that. So it comes gradually, and thank God it does. Otherwise, we might have biblically, a biblical proportion of what was you know, the great flood. <laughs> okay. Just too much, too much coming all at once. So I'm running out of time. And what I want to do here is I want to jump ahead, because there's something that I want to say that I think is kind of important. One of the central Baha'i principles is the equality of women and men. And the Baha'is believe that world peace is unobtainable without justice and equality for women. But we believe more than that, that we will not achieve world peace unless women are allowed, and I mean women globally, women worldwide, all women, are allowed to achieve education, to be able to advance themselves in all aspects of humanity, that it will be women that will end war. So I'll show you just quickly here a few other quotes, and then my time is going to be up. But um, well, here's one here. Women comprise more than 50% of the world's population, but only own 1% of the world's wealth. Do we have any work to do? We have tremendous amount of work to do. So 
And among the teachings of Baha'u'llah is the equality of men and women. Now, this you have to understand, this is unique to religion. You heard this before in religion? Not so much. The world of humanity has two wings. One is women and the other men. Not until both wings are equally developed can the bird fly. Should one wing remain weak, flight is impossible. So, this is a young girl. She's talking about you know, being raised in a, uh, in a nation where the repression of women is historic. And the fact that she was raised in a Baha'i family where the principle of the equality of women is absolute and unquestionable. So not until the world of women becomes equal to the world of men in the acquisition of virtues and perfections can success and prosperity be attained as they ought to be. So these are just a small sampling. Uh, the Baha'i Revelation, which covered 40 years, the founder who was imprisoned for 40 years, uh, but the Revelation was 40 years and over 100 volumes. And I've given you a few paragraphs of the 100 volumes. So, any questions for me? I don't think I even have, I, I have two minutes. <laughs> I was, um, 15. Please. I was born yeah. at the foot of uh, the Baha'i Temple in Haifa. Yeah, Mount Carmel, yeah. not far from the cave of Elijah. Yeah, yeah, profound. Yeah, been there several times and uh, in love with the area, in love with the people there, all the people. You got 15 minutes in there. How did that happen? I just looked at the program. No, no, no. That's a typo. That's a typo. Oh, yeah, sure. Okay. So you Fred said it. Don't call back. <laughs> it's got to be right. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's all good. Yes. Dr. Gail. What was that email address again? G.T. Yeah. Lawton, L-A-W-T-O-N. Yeah. At gmail.com. Got it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Could you go to the one right before? Sure, I'd be happy to. You know, when the reign of goddess existed before the male image of God, there was peace. When they converted to the male image, the warrior and... Uh, There's another warrior. quote in there about that, that the characteristics of men are more aggressive and more warlike, and the characteristics of women are more creative, more, you know, um, more sensitive. And when as women arise to their true station, equal to men, that it'll, it will counterbalance the aggression of men. Yeah. yeah. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. In, in Native American, the women are... The women choose the, uh, the, the, uh, the chief and serve at the women's intention. And the chiefs and the leaders are chosen by their service to the people. Right. And the women yeah. can't understand why we as women don't want to just be around women for a while. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's other reasons for it, but, you know, they they really can't understand me. I was out in Montana, and they just go, it's a break not to be around the moment. <laughs> I, like being I think my wife feels that way. <laughs> Good. Yeah. Time. Okay. So I'm done. Thank you. Thank you, guys.